Hi there. I hope you're doing really, really well. Uh, and welcome to uh, Ask Diane number one. I've struggled with what's the name of these episodes. And literally, like a few minutes before going live here, I said, when I call it Ask Daniel, you know, um, it was episode pod to distinguish them from the podcast once, and but then I started doing videos. So anyway, today we're going to talk about uh, four, uh, uh, four questions, and it's going to be one uh, is uh, an answer to Callie, who's going back to college, you know, scared about getting up every morning, 8 a.m., having 8 a.m.s. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, Julie who is more or less a success story. She's doing much better, but sometimes going kind of 10 days without sleeping, she here and there needs to take a temazepam or a Xanax or what, uh, some type of medication. I forget exactly which one it was. There's also a um, question from an anonymous uh, viewer who has noticed that, uh, you know, alcohol can be disruptive, but for her, it's like even a little amount hours before going to bed, can disrupt her sleep. And then Vince, uh, uh, we have a question from Vince and uh, there's a couple of things that I think are encouraging for those of you that are new to the channel. Vince has asked a lot of questions lately and uh, we're of course hopeful that he's gonna do much better coming up here. This said, uh, we're gonna start. No, um, my usual disclaimer here, nothing is medical advice here, just general thoughts and advice that I hope will be helpful to everyone that is tuning in here. So with that said, let's actually let's actually start with this uh, this comment uh, from from Callie. This is um, this is a comment on uh, Insomnia Insight number two hundred and thirty two uh, that came in uh, twenty one hours ago. Daniel exclamation mark! Hi, I'm so upset. I'm definitely relapsing. I'm watching some of your videos at two a.m. and try to help myself, but I'm just so worried. I'm in college. I have 8 a.m. this coming semester. First of all, that scares me. And right now, I'm just, I just want to sleep. I have to wake up early tomorrow. And it's 2 a.m. It's just hard to tell myself it's okay. It'll be okay. But sometimes it doesn't work. Any thoughts? I don't want to go back to this. So um, uh, a brief, um, brief review here of what I, what I remember from previous uh, interactions with Callie is, uh, you know, many months ago, she and uh, she was going on a trip and she wanted to do and she actually went on that trip and actually slept well. That's kind of the main thing I remember, but more recently, and, and I think she's been sleeping well, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Kelly, but I think uh, she's been sleeping well until recently, again, going on a trip and uh, worried about that and now seems to have some more, um, uh, more, than, more than the occasional insomnia, like more insomnia here lately. Now, uh, reading this, this comment, I think there's a lot we can learn. Uh, of course, one is, um, you know, it's 2 a.m. as she's writing this comment and just want to sleep. She has to get up early in the morning, which is so common. And it just highlights one super important thing about insomnia that um, I know I say all the time, but it's super important, which is the more we want to sleep, the more desperate we want to sleep, the less likely sleep is to happen. So when you're in bed, it's 2 a.m., you know, you want to sleep in that, that hole, that scenario makes it really difficult. Uh, the pressure to sleep, and also knowing what time it is and calculating, etc. So, uh, so that's the challenge. We're going to get back to that in a second. But uh, I always try to, to start with some, you know, encouraging things. And one of them is for you, for Callie here uh, has had trouble sleeping. Used, you know, the insights techniques that I talk about here, slept better, and now again has some trouble sleeping. Now the good news is you slept good for a long time. You can sleep. There's nothing wrong with you. You know, you can sleep. That's always so good to, to highlight. Oftentimes, we can go weeks or even a month sleeping well, and then we don't sleep well, and then we really focus on that, like, what am I doing wrong? What should I do now, etc. When if we can focus on what happened before that, the months or weeks when we're sleeping well, if that can get the bulk of the attention and we kind of treat the sleeplessness that's happened more recently as kind of a hiccup, that's the unusual part. Our baseline is good. Now we're kind of having a hiccup. That in itself can be really helpful. But getting more practical here, uh, I think um, uh, there's no way one can make oneself sleep, and that can be really hard to accept. But acceptance is super powerful once you once you do that. Once you start seeing that, okay, I can't make myself sleep, so let me do something else. That's when sleep happens. Now, here's the thing: when when we don't have, uh, I had a patient. Um, when was that? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, that told me about her trouble sleeping and said. 
but I've been lucky because my job is flexible. I don't have to get up. So like if I don't sleep very well, I can, I can sleep in the morning. In my mind, I was hearing this. I was like, that probably has not worked in your favor. That has become like a coping mechanism that has actually allowed you to, or that has probably kept your insomnia going for a longer period of time. And so when I read this a message from Cali here, I'm thinking the fact that you're going to have 8 a.m.s, like you mentioned, you kind of have to get up at a certain time in the morning, that usually works in your favor. That really works in your favor because it's that fixed time point. It's like that thing that anchors your sleep, and it really helps having something that forces you up every time, every morning at the same time. That is really helpful. And now another question here becomes what if – this happens like you're up at 2 a.m. and like you know you have to be up at 6 a.m. and like what should you be doing? Well, the first thing is, you, you know, first thing is actually it's good not to know the time. Once you know the time, well, that then you kind of like, you know, that, that the, when you know the time, there's no way to unknow that. There's no way to take that out of your mind. So then you are you calculating how much you slept, you're calculating how much you have left to sleep, you're thinking about how you're going to sleep the following morning, etc. So I think for anyone that's going through a period where you have a lot of trouble sleeping not knowing the time is super important. Um, timelessness is the solution for sleeplessness, really. Uh, so that's one thing. Second thing is, again, knowing that you can't make yourself sleep. That can actually be empowering when you're trying to do things to make yourself sleep. That always backfires. So kind of acceptance is really important. And the other thing is just get up at the same time every morning. Don't get a bit too early and just keep going. And then for somebody like yourself, Kelly, know that this has happened before. You've had periods of not sleeping well uh, before, and you've gotten to a place of good sleep. And every time, I believe, every time somebody goes through a period of sleeplessness, simply by using the techniques I talked about here, that strength and sleep confidence, you know, if you if you come back to sleeping well one time, good. If you come back to sleep well two times, better. Like the more times you go back to sleeping well, the stronger your sleep confidence becomes. So um, hang in the Cali, and uh, I am confident you'll go back to sleeping well again. Okay, cool. So that said, let's actually jump to this email from Vince. And this came in two days ago. And Vince wrote the following. I just came to realize my soul with wakefulness at night because when I'm tired, I can easily take a nap in daytime. How do I associate my mind with sleep again? I know I'm, I've been doing CBTI, cognitive behavioral therapy, and so on, but why isn't it working yet? I know I have difficulty keeping my sleep window, but on some nights I do fall perfectly. I can't sleep. Why is that? So um, for those of you not familiar with CBTI, that stands for cognitive behavioral therapy, insomnia, which is basically like all the things I talk about here is really CBTI. Uh, now, sleep window is uh, one of the key uh, CBTI techniques, which is where you decide upon a certain window, let's say from midnight to six, kind of my standard example, midnight to six, which means that you should get up six o'clock every morning, and then you should not go to bed before midnight. And uh, Vince is asking a couple of things. One of them, I'll start with the first one, which is like, uh, uh, when I'm tired, um, I can easily take a nap in the daytime. Why is that? It's a kind of common question. Why is it that when I um, you know, am I, am I, am I, when I'm at work, sorry, or when I'm watching TV in the afternoon or do something, I easily fall asleep. But when I go to bed at night, I can't sleep. The reason for that is that kind of what I said earlier uh, in this episode here with Callie, the, the more we want to sleep, the harder it becomes. If we really want to sleep, it becomes even harder. If we're desperate for sleep, it becomes really hard. And the reason is that you know, sleep happens when the mind is like, um, you know, not uh, focused on on sleep. Like when we're thinking about something pleasant, we're in bed, it's dark, we're kind of ready to sleep. It happens easily when we're in bed, thinking about like, am I going to sleep? Am I not going to sleep? What's going to happen? Let's see, we're self monitoring, we're worried, etc. Sleep becomes really difficult. And the more we do that, the more intensely we think about how, how sleep, like, is it going to happen? I wish I could sleep. I hope I could sleep. The less of it we get. So when, when it's in, it was daytime, you don't actually want to sleep. You're actually trying, using the sleep window technique, you're trying to stay awake. You don't want to sleep. You want to be awake during the day so that you can sleep at night. Guess what? When we want to stay awake, sleep comes easy. 
All right, so that, that's why people often feel like when I'm watching TV, I can easily sleep, but then when I go to bed, I can't because when we don't want to sleep, it happens easy. When we do want to sleep, it becomes much more difficult. So the second question here is like, how do I associate my mind with sleep again? Well, the, the, the associations happen when kind of our brain makes connections. So for somebody that always has slept really great in a certain bed, well, they're, they associate that bed with sleep and it's of course easy for them to continue doing that. But there's no way you can create that association, um, you know, by any trick or, or using some kind of mindset thing or like the only thing you can create that association between, let's say, uh, sleep and the bed or, 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 or uh, nighttime and sleep or other helpful associations is to start sleeping at night, sleeping in your bed. And how can you do that using your sleep window, you know? We can't control when we sleep, but we can control when we're awake, wakefulness. So making sure you get up at the same time every morning, staying awake during the day, and then having that narrow window where you allow yourself to sleep at night. With time, after a couple of weeks, you start falling asleep in your bed, you start falling asleep at night, and that's how the sleep window helps create that association between the bed and sleep and nighttime and sleep as well. And, and then this first, the second question here is like, I know I'm been doing CBTI, but why isn't it working yet? Well, one really important thing is that nothing can make you sleep. Nothing can produce sleep. You know, medications can make you kind of drowsy and allow your body to sleep, but it, they cannot produce sleep. Same thing with CBTI. Cognitive behavioral therapy cannot produce sleep. If somebody approaches CBTI uh, with kind of that goal or like this method, CBTI, sleep window, this is going to make me sleep. It is going to become a sleep effort. It's going to be something that you do to produce sleep. Anything you do to produce sleep, anything you do because you want to sleep will produce insomnia. And when somebody asks me, like, why isn't sleep like working? In my mind, I'm hearing, why isn't this making me sleep? And, and in my mind, then again, I go like, this has become a sleep effort. This person is doing this CBTI with the specific purpose of producing sleep, which never works. So, um, so that is kind of, Probably why it's not working is because you're approaching it as a as something that will make you sleep. But also, you kind of answering your uh, you have the answer uh, yourself here. I know I have difficulty. But the sleep window only works. See that only works if you're consistent. You know, if some one day you get up at early and you stay up during the day, but then you still can't sleep, and then the following day you kind of sleep in and you sleep a little bit during the day, it is not going to be helpful. It's not going to quote unquote work. Um, and when I say quote unquote, I mean Nothing can produce sleep, but using the sleep window, you can kind of um, use your body's own sleep drive, your body's needs for sleep to your favor. So I think for somebody that consistently does their sleep window, consistently gets up at six, consistently, for example, doesn't go to bed at midnight, consistently stays awake during the day, sleep will happen. Sleep will happen. So I think you know, you kind of know what to work on, Vince. And, and you know what I'm so encouraged about today is that I haven't actually gotten an email from Vince today, which is unusual, which is great, which is a sign to me that maybe the hyper arousal is going down a little bit. Uh, but uh, anyway, Vince, keep working on us. Uh, I know you're working with Martin Reed, great guy. I, I know you're going to do really well. So uh, keep keep going, definitely. Uh, so that said, let's move to another email. And this came in uh, one day ago. And this is from Julie. And Julie, I, I made one of these like success stories about her and uh, I can't remember exactly what it was, but well, you know what? It wasn't, it was an episode pod. It was an episode pod episode where I realized as I was reading an email from Julie that it was kind of a success story that she was doing really well. What I remember is she, is, she listened to the podcast. Uh, she's from Australia. She reached out several months ago and, and then again, a few months ago and a few months ago, she'd actually been doing really well following the techniques I talked about here. Plus she's read this excellent book, The Effortless Sleep Method. I, again, I'm, I'm in this kind of street now where I'm, I've had a, a few clients that have done really well after reading this. So again, if you haven't read it, uh, I think it's a great, great book. Um, anyway, so back to Julie's email from here more recently. Hi Daniel, just touching base with you. Merry Christmas. I'm doing quite well still, although had a couple of 10 day stretches when I couldn't get off to sleep. Uh, due to my partner being away at, uh, and um, maybe both of us being away for a weekend. And eventually after a few days needed to reach for 
etamazepam or diazepam. Um, I did have an aha moment from one of your podcasts. I think it was you said insomnia can sometimes not be so much a sleep problem, but an anxiety problem. Bingo, hearing that resonated big time with me. My insomnia started with hyper arousal, but quickly degenerated into anxiety over all the what ifs associated with not sleeping, of which there are many. If you're anxious, you uh, you can't be relaxed. And if you're not relaxed, going to sleep is probably not, that sleep is not gonna happen. That's how it's been for me anyway. So I'm back to sleeping, mostly with the medication. There's a lot of applauding hands and a butterfly there too. <laughs> um, I have the medication there as a backup. I really don't touch it unless I really think it's the best short-term option. Can't tell me how much you helped me and um, keep it up, please. Uh, you say things with empathy and understanding and uh, a lot of encouragement from Julia. So I'm super happy about this. And overall, I kind of want to share this as a, a, again, a, a success story, like somebody who's doing much better after realizing his, uh, sleep, sleep uh, insomnia is really an anxiety uh, problem, not, you know, a faulty brain switch or like you know, a hormonal problem or some underlying strange thing going on. Uh, and then I just wanted to say, uh, one, one thing which was like, um, I, I think the, the thing with medications is that as long as one does not think that they produce sleep, I don't think they're a problem. If somebody knows that, you know, I'm going to go on this trip and I know I'm going to have a lot of anxiety and this is my medication for anxiety and I, 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 I am going to take it today and tomorrow and then they happen to also make you sleep better. I don't think that's a problem. Uh, the, the problem becomes more when somebody starts believing that they can't sleep without them or that they produce sleep. So what can happen is, um, let's say somebody's doing pretty well, like Julie, and, and has some medications, but usually don't take them, doesn't want to take them. And then uh, something happens, and this person is like, I think I'm going to do fine. I'm going to try not to take them. But then at some part of their mind is like, maybe I should, or maybe I shouldn't. And then they say, no, I'm not going to do it. And then, oh, maybe I should. And then like four days later, like hasn't slept much at all. And that behavior can easily lead to a position where you, we think that I usually don't need it, but sometimes when I think things are really bad, then I have to take it. And, and the, but, but what could be happening what could very well be happening is not so much that, you know, insomnia is really bad, uh, certain stretches whereby you have to take it, but rather that, you know, you are thinking about taking it or not. You know, the process of debating whether you should take it, should not take it, should take half of it, should take less than half of it, etc. That can produce a lot of insomnia. And, and sometimes you may, by like going towards kind of like a stretch of days, we haven't slept at all, finally taking a medication, you can kind of miss out on an opportunity to see that you would have started sleeping better without using anything else. And for somebody who wants to take, uh, you know, get off medication, that could be like a, a bit evidence that you actually never need it. But, you know, Julie, I don't know if this applies to you at all, but I thought using your email as an example here could maybe help other people that, um, you know, kind of want to take the final step and, and, and don't use medications. But, Again, if somebody uses them here and there, not to produce sleep, but know that they're just there to kind of take away anxiety, totally fine uh, from a sleep perspective anyway. I don't think that hurts your sleep confidence. So, Julie, I want to say thank you for support. I'm super happy you're doing better. And, um, and uh, yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. Stay in touch. And then finally here, uh, an email from a, a viewer that wanted to remain anonymous. And uh, let's read it. Hi, love your channel, it's helped a lot. I am super happy to hear this and uh, and thank you for sending me a question. It's so helpful to get questions, so I'm really, really grateful for everyone. I went through a stressful couple of years and the move triggered insomnia, which I never experienced before. I went through CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, and I'm doing much better overall. I have a bad night. I, uh, if I have a bad night, I quickly get worked up that my insomnia is back though. I also have a question regarding alcohol specifically. Obviously, it isn't great for sleep, but now I have a lot of trouble falling asleep after just one glass, even if it's before bedtime, even if it's hours before bedtime. 
I have to assume that it's in my head and just one glass of wine can't mess up sleep several hours before I go to bed, or can it? I usually sleep pretty well during the week, but if I go out with friends, and this always happens, um, sorry, I usually sleep pretty well during the week, but if I go out with friends, this always happens. Am I okay cutting it out, wine alcohol, altogether? No, sorry, I'm messing up. I am okay cutting it out, wine alcohol, altogether, but curious if I'm just making this up or not, uh, or not given the small amount. We'd love to hear your insight. So um, really, really good question. And, and um, I want to say firstly uh, that, well, firstly, of course, being positive here, awesome, good job, strong work using CBT to, to feel better. That is, it's not easy. We know that, but it's really helpful, really works. So um, good job, good job. Um, now, uh, if I have a bad night, I quickly get worked up that my son is back though. Common, common, that's very common. And and the reason is, you know, not it's not hard to see why that happens for somebody that's never had trouble sleeping. They have a bad night. Well, guess what? Then they'll be like, oh, that was weird. But then their sleep confidence is really not affected too much. And they just go back sleeping well again. Now, if somebody that's ever had insomnia has a bad night, that can be triggering, kind of like PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and that can lead to, you know, a stronger reaction to a sleepless night than for somebody who hasn't had insomnia. The important there, I believe, is to recognize that that is also normal, meaning having a stronger reaction, like instead of having one sleepless night after stress, having two sleepless nights after stress, if you have had insomnia, that's normal, that's expected, that's, that's, that's totally expected. And the more you think of it that way, the more you think of it as expected, the less you'll have of it. And, um, and uh, it's, you know, what I tell people that are like, um, that I see in clinic for the last time or in, um, in as clients in my app, Bedtime with the Y, if you have an iPhone, check it out. If you have an Android, it's coming out. Uh, clients that are like graduating, I tell them kind of verbatim, like, you know, if you have a sleepless night, It's a completely normal reaction to um, change, to anxiety, to stress, to excitement. So, um, just a just a little a few a few thoughts on that and that part. Now, going to the more specific question regarding alcohol here. Um, let's start here. I was, I was thinking about something as I was reading, which was this one. I have to assume this in my head, and just one glass of wine can't mess my sleep uh, up several hours before I go to bed, or can it? You know, that last like, or can it? That tells us that there is this what if. There is this thinking about like, could it really be the alcohol that's gonna, that's making this happen? Even hours after I take just one little glass of wine, could it really be that or not? Is this just in my head or is it really causing it? What I'm trying to say here is that as, as always, it is, it is the thought process. It is the thinking, the debating, the figuring out that is the real culprit. You know, if you are not, if you, you know, if alcohol is uh, producing insomnia, then it's obvious, right? You know, you had, you drank this much and you, this, it disrupted your sleep this much. If that's, if you know that if I have a whole glass of wine, one hour go to bed, I won't sleep well then I think it's it's easy to see that that's the culprit. If it's like a tiny amount, many, many hours before you go to bed, then it's more likely that it is the thinking about it, the, the kind of the wondering if it is, that is the real culprit. So, um, so for most people in this situation, I would say it's quote unquote in your head, it's the thinking about it that's the problem rather than alcohol itself. Um, and then the question comes like, so so then knowing this, like, should you cut out wine alcohol altogether? Uh, or, or is it just kind of like, or should I not? Well, I think, um, um, what was it? I was just about to say something about this, which is, oh yeah, this is, this is what I was gonna say. Uh, for someone that enjoys something, whether that's that coffee you have or um, hang out with friends or having uh, wine or alcohol, et cetera, Whenever we give something up that we enjoy, that empowers insomnia. Like, 
my friend uh, Martin Reed, insomnia coach, uh, he he did this video one time where he used like a cookie monster uh, doll and he was feeding cookies and he was like, this is just like insomnia. And the cookie monster was like, give me a cookie, give me a cookie. And then he was like, okay, here you go. And then it was quiet for a while, but then soon again, it's like, give me a cookie, give me a cookie. And insomnia is kind of like that. The more you feed it, the more you give it, it'll just keep asking for more and more. And, uh, and why is that? Like, what do I mean by that? What, what, like, what is, if we go deep into that analogy, what does it really mean? Well, the way I think about it is that with insomnia, it's that part of your brain is like, out, it is there to actually protect you. And it's identified that sleeplessness is a problem and it wants you to take care of it. The problem is that nothing can produce sleep. Nothing can actually make you sleep more, but that threat detector in your brain kind of wants you to do stuff. So you, um, let's say, it tells you you got to sleep more and you're like, oh, I'm going to stop drinking coffee. And then you're wondering like, is that going to help? So I can help. It actually didn't help. But then your, your brain's like, that didn't help. You got to do something more. And then you're like, oh, I'm going to stop going out with my friends. And then that didn't help either. And it's like, you got to do more. You got to do more. And then, you know, in the kind of worst case scenario, you have these patients that are like completely like isolated, just like do everything they can to protect their sleep. And I'm just, I'm just sharing this as a, an illustration of how if there's something we enjoy in our lives, then I believe, my belief is that we should never, never not do those because of protecting sleep. Um, uh, so, and, and uh, yeah, uh, so that, uh, yeah, I hope that, hope that was helpful um, to you. And uh, again, well done on CBT, uh, CBT or CBTI. Um, and with that said, I think we will, conclude here um and uh i what is it today's monday uh we'll be back tomorrow and i uh, i thought about this episode for a few days which is i i think i said i was going to earlier but it didn't happen but tomorrow uh we're going to talk about uh, basil and how she sleeps like a cat um so yeah i hope uh hope you guys have a good night morning wherever you are and uh i'll be back here tomorrow until then take it easy